You're listening to Razor Riffs with Keith Razor and Alan Lee right here on LA Talk Radio. Hey guys, welcome uh, to Razor Riffs. This is Keith Reza. Uh Alan Lee is not here today, uh, so it's just me, one man show, and my beautiful guest, Rosie Tran. Yay! Thanks yeah. for having me, Keith. Yeah. They can't is... see me, can they, on the camera? Yeah. This they is, can, so this they is... can know if I'm beautiful or not. Yeah. <laughs> they know you're beautiful. Oh, we already got a phone call. Okay, I got I to gotta pick this. This is when the headphones okay, come. Okay, all right. Back. Hello. Yeah. This is Hi. Hi. What's your name? Uh Kara. Kara. Hi Kara. Hi. Yeah. Kara. Hi. Is this the show? This is the show. How are you? Oh. I'm good and how are you? I'm doing swell. Uh tonight's topic is uh babies. You have any babies? Oh really? Yeah, I'm sitting next to my two year old right now. Oh, your two year old? That's a toddler, Keith. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Do you listen to the show a lot or no? Uh, to the show? Yeah, I just started listening to it. I was listening to her on Calling Out on um, with Susan Pinsky. Oh, you're on that show, Rosie, right? No, I'm not. You're not on that <laughs> show. This, this is the Keith Reza show. This is what? This is the Keith Reza show. This isn't uh, Rebecca Fearing? No. Isn't she supposed to be on at seven? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know. I think she's on at eight. But do, do you want me to, like, text her and tell her you called or something? Who is this? <laughs> you called Who us. did I call? You called... You I'm called, confused. Uh, you called a phone sex hotline. <laughs> First for real? Yeah. No. Yeah. This is a couple's phone sex. Oh, okay. Sorry. No worries. You okay. Don't, you don't want to have I a threesome with me and Keith? Else. Oh, and your baby? What? You don't want to have a threesome with us? Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I like how she calls us and she's upset. <laughs> wow, that was fun. <laughs> So what was I saying before I was really in a You were saying welcome to Reza Rifts and that you were oh, saying yeah. that I was lovely. And then I said, can people see me? I don't think she, yeah, I don't think she got the joke though. Cause I was like, you want to have a threesome with me and Rosie and then your baby? She was pissed. She was like, goodbye. Yeah. Well. All right. Um, is there anything I can't say on the air? I can't like curse or whatever. Is it oh, I try whatever? not to curse, okay. but I mean, if it happens. For you your know. sponsors. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having a hard time getting sponsors for this show. You want to hear a sponsor story? I went to Home Depot to try and get sponsors, and uh, I talked to the general manager, and they were, like, really interested, you know? And they're like, how many people do you have listened to? And I was, like, honest, you know? I was like, five? And he's like, excellent. We could use 5,000 viewers. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, no, no, five. <laughs> <laughs> so he thought I wasted his time, but I was like, I could probably get it up to seven. <laughs> more than that come on yeah there is it, it's not home depot standards but but you know. apparently home depot standards are pretty low because five thousand is not that high for a radio show it's not no usually it's like millions of listeners or hundred thousands of listeners. well you you have a podcast right i well, do have a podcast how many viewers is that it varies you know sometimes we get a couple thousand some guests depending on how popular they are we get yeah. a couple hundred and see that's why i'm <laughs> that's why i'm never on the rosie tran podcast because i only can guarantee you five <laughs> <laughs> no keith you haven't been on because you don't match my theme and i'm trying to space out my comedian friends because uh. i'm trying to do other guests political guests and other interests other than stand up so so it's like a it's an interest podcast Work. Um, it's called Out of the Box, and I feature out of the box thinkers from politics to religion, science, whatever. But um, I rarely have comedians. I've actually only had I think three or four comedians on the show. Yeah. So, and I tried to have them talk about something other than comedy because. Yeah, because comedy gets boring, boring. sometimes. <laughs> well, see, when I did this, I wanted to do it 
I wanted to get guests that didn't want to talk about comedy, but also wanted to talk about comedy. I can talk about comedy. I cannot talk about comedy. You know what's weird? I just noticed we're both wearing glasses. I know, Keith. We're soulmates. I know. Well, you're married, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Rosie Tran always said that she wasn't married and she didn't meet her husband. Keith Razor would be number fifty-seven on the <laughs> list. <laughs> I don't think I said fifty-seven. I think I said a higher number. Wow. <laughs> Way to ruin my ego. <laughs> higher number, 112. No, a, hi- a higher number, like higher, closer to one. Oh. Closer, like lower, so lower number. Oh, lower number. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so yeah, this was fun. You went to go get food, and then you uh, drove in the alley. I did. I yeah. got lost. I drove in the alley. I almost, almost uh, got lost. I stopped to get food, and... Um, you know, I I was gonna buy you a pizza. Uh, I'm Little trying to watch my figure at though. Little Caesars, and I couldn't get into Little Caesars because there was another medium. So I went median. So I went to another pizza place with a bunch of, uh, I think, Middle Eastern ladies working there, and I asked them how long it would take a pizza to make a pizza, and they said 20 minutes. Uh. So then I got a sandwich, and I rushed my butt over here. Well, see if you got. <laughs> and then the, I got lost in an alley. If you got the pizza, you would have just missed a. Me having phone sex with that Rebecca lady. I know. I so totally missed it. The joke wouldn't have been funny because it would have been just you and the baby. Yeah, <laughs> that's just creepy. And then, yeah, that's not fun. <laughs> so what's up? You've been like manic tweeting about Bill Cosby all week. Oh yeah, Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby has Bill Cosby responded to you, Keith? No, I think uh, Bill Cosby. I don't uh, think Bill Cosby knows how to use Twitter or runs his own Twitter. I agree, but I think uh, Bill Cosby's in a little little heat right now. You know yes. what I'm saying? And everyone over the age of like 65, if they have a Twitter account, it's run by their publicity team. Yeah. And then they tweet like once a month. Well, <laughs> my Twitter's ran by my publicity team. Your right hand? <laughs> <laughs> no, but see, um, I love it how like I bring you on to interview and you're interviewing me about Twitter. Well, you're not asking questions i was gonna ask you a question okay, then, you, then you brought up twitter i'm ready because i've been following i don't follow that many other comedians unless i really like them and they're my friends or you know they're big celebrities because a lot of comedians their timeline is not cool and they just tweet about their shows or tweet annoying things so i see your tweets a lot there you know my timeline is pretty thin and i, I saw you manic tweeting about bill cosby all week my my twitter it's not that interesting but no, I think we should tell the folks that are listening, like, you know, if they want to call back for that threesome, how we met. You know, do you remember how we met? I don't remember how we met, Keith, because uh-huh. it's been so long. How long have we known each other? Eight years? Yeah, it's been something like that. But we met... That's longer than most marriages in California. <laughs> that, Well, yeah, it's longer than most presidents' terms. <laughs> so, how did we meet? <laughs> so, we met at Martini Blues. Bill Word. Bill Word. And you're hysterical and funny, and uh, I've o- I always tell people this, but you're the first headliner that actually like let me open up for you, because oh, you're so sweet. Uh, well, if I could get booked again somewhere as a headliner, yeah. then I would take you. <laughs> yeah, but see, you but you were the first one. We did Irvine Improv together, and that was when I was a nobody. You know, no one would give me the chance and stuff. So. And now, yeah. Keith, you're so sweet. You never booked me on any of your shows. <laughs> what? I don't... Uh, you just did Brea with me, like, last... Only because I went down to support you. I was not a booked comedian on the show. I was a drop-in. <laughs> it, it was funny about that. It was funny about that show because um, Patrick Laborio was supposed to ke- uh, co-headline it. And he's like, oh, I just want to do 15. Let Rosie up. I was like... <laughs> I was like, but you're the co-headliner. You're just doing 15, and I have to get stuck with the 30. <laughs> you know what I, I mean? I think I actually made some of the audience members mad because some of your audience members, if you're listening, five audience people, or five listeners. It's my mom, dad, and my sisters. Um, I had one of your fans, I don't know if it was a fan of yours or Pat's, came up to me after the show, and she was talking to me about how she used to buy my cookies that I would sell. And I really, really appreciated her her saying that, but I didn't get a chance to talk to her because... Um, for those of you who don't know, during Keith's headlining set, um, a girl was kicked out for fighting. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then her boyfriend was kicked out for fighting and arrested. And that was kind of going on behind this lady's head. Um, so I felt bad because I kind of totally ignored her. And, she, and you lost a Twitter follower I that lo- night. possibly lost a Twitter follower and a fan because I did not acknowledge her telling me this. But I was kind of ADD. And in addition to that, I was I was being your, your lollipop um, prostitute. 
Yeah, so. yeah. I sell lollipops after my shows. Uh, Rosie actually gave me that idea. She didn't give me the lollipop idea, but she's like, you got to sell merch to make money. And, and I did it work? Has well, my advice worked? Yeah, but I mean, I don't know how to bake cookies, so what I did <laughs> was I bought lollipops and I just put a sticker. But have you made money from my suggestion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I make, all that matters. I make more money selling merch than I do actually doing stand-up. That's how it always works. Craig Shoemaker, I think, makes 40000 a year just from his merchandise. Really? And other comedians that have encouraged me to sell stuff because I used to be really judgmental about it. And I was like, Oh, selling stuff, you know, stupid. But for those of you who don't know, when you pay the 10 or $15 to go to a comedy club, most of that money goes to the comedy club owners to run the club, pay the waitress, um, the wait staff and the bartenders and little to none of that goes to the comedians, if yeah. any. So buy merch from comedians. Cause that's how we make our money. It's sad. Yeah. Well, I'm peddling less... popsicles, literally. <laughs> well, see the thing that like, like I did, I did. I headlined uh, San Diego last week, and I actually called you to say if you wanted to go with me, but you were stuck babysitting or something, or uh, baby, ba- shower. baby shower. Yeah, I think I was the lady on the phone's baby shower. <laughs> <laughs> so how was it? <laughs> it was it was fun, but see, I I did the show, and um, this comic on the show he writes me. He's like, "Hey, can I sell merch?" I was like, "I don't care," you know. He's like, oh, but you're the headliner. I was like, some yeah. headliners get mad if you sell merch. I've I, done, I was like, well, I featured for headliners can. because that's their like a lot of money that they make. I've featured for headliners and I asked them, and they've said a lot of them have said yes. Some of them have said no. Yeah. Some of them have said okay, but you can't. Um, like for example, when I had T-shirts, if they were twenty-five and the headliner had T-shirts that were twenty, the headliner would ask me to sell my T-shirts for twenty. Like they didn't want me to like make more. It's weird. It's weird. Yeah, <laughs> I've never, I've never heard that. I was just like, oh, whatever. Yeah, I've heard that. But see, the thing about merch is like, because I used to have T-shirts. I didn't. I made about three hundred. I never sold them, but I started giving them away because you know no one would buy them because I, I sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I'm not saying I suck now. I mean I'm okay at the but, time. Yeah, at okay. the time I was horrible. And the thing is like um. I think it was like a laughing joke on me because, you know, I was all selling shirts and I thought I was better than I was. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think now, like, a lot of comics, they're just making shirts to sell them when they are not really that... Like, I think if you're not good enough to sell merch, you shouldn't sell merch. Um, I don't know because there, comedy is a weird thing. Like, I have seen comedians that were not funny. Yeah. Not funny at all. Like Keith Reza? No, not like you. Oh. Comedians that were just ac- absolutely awful not funny at all thought i thought in my mind this person will never be funny and then something happens in their brain after doing it for a certain amount of years and it like clicks in and then all of a sudden they're really funny yeah so i don't tend to be too haterish on people because you just never know and you never know what they're going through you never know what their financial situation is you know Look, if they're not that funny and they're selling stuff, most likely people aren't going to buy it for them. Buy yeah. it for them anyway. So who cares that they have it out there? I really don't care. If so, I'm not going to hate on someone who's trying to make a buck. Oh, that's great advice. Yeah. I, on the, on the other hand, stick to my statement. <laughs> of hating on people who are trying to make a buck? <laughs> I, I, I think if you're not good enough to sell T-shirts, you shouldn't sell T-shirts. I mean, don't. I'm not saying you're not funny, but I'm saying like... If you have a bad set that night and you like want to sell shirts after, I was like, uh. But sometimes people buy more stuff when you have a bad set. Really? I've noticed that when I've had bad sets, people, I think maybe they feel sorry for me or there's, I don't know the reason. Yeah. And I've had other headliners say the same thing. Like, oh, I sell more stuff when I don't do that well. Because I think maybe people feel bad for you. So they want to support you. Oh. Yeah. So I've sold more stuff sometimes. sometimes not well, I'm going to constantly bomb now. <laughs> <laughs> see if i could sell like two lollipops instead of one <laughs> but no um rosie uh, i have a question uh you were on last comic standing i was for five seconds for five seconds <laughs> but you were on the tv show but it didn't air a lot of your material it didn't i was a so i was a regional finalist which means what happens is last comic standing is a lot different now because they have set auditions. Was this when Dat Fam was on it? Or no, was it? I was on it the season that Eliza was on it. Oh, uh, excellent. And um, I was a regional finalist, which basically means that um, there was 30 finalists in LA, which they whittled down to 10. And I was one of the 30 finalists. Um, Tyra Vera was a finalist, Jen Murphy, a lot of the people that we know. Yeah. Um, 
and they cut they got their air cut air time cut too ty rivera was on that i never knew that ty rivera was was the finalist when i was a finalist wow um a regional finalist so every city new york they had las vegas i think they had houston had 30 finalists and they narrowed that down to like five or ten and then those people went to vegas yeah um a year later i was on the set of a short film and the director of the film, who is an Asian, I can't remember her name. I can look it up on IMDb. But she's an Asian American woman who said she was a huge fan of mine. And she was also an editor on Last Comic Standing. Wow. And she said she really, really fought for me to get on the show more. But the producers wanted to feature Esther Ku, who they considered more attractive than me. And she also had a deal with NBC. Oh, really? So they didn't want to feature two Asian women. Oh. Yeah. Well, I don't know Esther Q, but there's no way she's more attractive to you than you. You're like one of the most beautiful women in the world. Keith, you're going to Google her and be like, well, she's way hotter than you, Rosie. <laughs> uh, I just did. and uh, She's I, pretty hot. <laughs> I stick by my standard. There's no one more beautiful than Rosie Tran. Oh, my gosh. People are going to think I paid you to say that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You bought lollipops. <laughs> but, um... But no, that's interesting. So like, I didn't even know that. That was like a year and a half later yeah. when I was on the set of the short film and it was totally random. And yeah. the girl that was directing it told me that. So that kind of made me feel better, but not really because I would have rather had the exposure and had it help my career more. Did you ever do Comics Unleashed? I haven't done Comics Unleashed. We should do Comics Unleashed. I know. They should book us. Byron yeah. Allen, come yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hear he's sponsored by Home Depot. <laughs> He has more than 5,000 fans. <laughs> yeah. But um, but no, that's interesting. Who won that? Oh, Eliza won Eliza that. won yeah. that year, and it was the first woman that has, has won. So I had um I had Dat Fam on a couple of weeks ago, and he was the original. The original Last Comic Standing. The original Last Comic Standing, and he kind of like danced around the Last Comic Standing questions. You know what I mean? I'll answer all the Last Comic Standing questions you want. I mean... Like, uh, I auditioned four years in a row the first year I auditioned. But you didn't audition. Like, when you make this show, does it say you can't audition again? Uh, no, I've auditioned four or five years in a row. Uh. The first year I auditioned, um, I was really green yeah. and I wasn't that funny, but they were pretty mean to me. And it was very dramatic, very reality style TV. You know, I said less than a sentence and they said, Look, honey, stand up's not for you. I didn't even finish the punchline. Wow. And then they had a camera in my face and they're like, How does it feel to be rejected? And it was super intense reality TV style. The second year, I drove all the way to San Francisco and auditioned. And um, I was one of the only women in the line. I think there was me and another girl named Gretchen, who's a local San Francisco comedian. We were literally the only girls in the line. And so everyone was thinking we were going to make it. Right before I went up to audition, um, the producers of the show came up to me and said, we have two drop-ins that are going to audition before you. And they put two supermodels in front of me who had no stand-up experience and they moved on. And then Gretchen wow. moved on and I didn't, and I didn't, which is fine. And, um, behind closed doors, they told me that I didn't have a chance because I was Vietnamese and dad had won the first year. Oh yeah. I auditioned again the fourth year. Um, and uh, now the first year and the second year I stood in line after that, I had a manager, um, which who I'm no longer with and I got audition spots. Wow. So see, I just got a manager. So I'm hoping, yeah, audition <laughs> yeah, spots. I'm hoping I could get audition spots. And then I find out that's on hiatus. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, like, cause I auditioned for last comic standing with, through the email. They said, Oh great. We'll keep in touch. See if you're good for a show. And like, I don't mean to brag, but I think I'm pretty good for the show. Cause you know what I mean? I'm the kid from Two and a Half Men. I need, <laughs> I need my, I need. You know, a punch. It's random. I sent, I sent in my my link through the email and and no response. So. Yeah. But I auditioned, um, then again, and then I made it as a regional finalist. And then I auditioned the next year after that. They actually called me. The producers called me on my cell phone, and they said, "Hey, we, you auditioned last year, and we want you to come in." I, this, I didn't have a manager. I had fired my manager or broke up with him, whatever at the time. Oh, you you were dating your manager? No, I call it breaking up. But <laughs> breaking up? We weren't dating. Oh. Um, I broke up with my manager and let let him out to pasture, <laughs> and then um, no, we just went our separate ways. Yeah, yeah. And then I they called me and um, I was doing a documentary at the time, so they shot it for the documentary, but then it was too windy and the footage got screwed up. But they called me and said, "Hey, you auditioned for us last year and you're regional finalist. We want you to audition again." 
So I had a preset audition again with no manager. This time I kind of got it by myself. You and, go, girl. And I went in and, you know, I knew the judges personally. This is when Greg Gr- Giraldo was hosting and Natasha Legero, who I started with. And yeah. they said, oh, hi, Rosie. And um, they said, no, they have little earpieces in their ear that tell them, the producers tell them who to pick. Oh, really? Yeah, it's like totally rigged. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. And also my friend Adam Hunter, who did it the year Eliza did it, said it was totally rigged because he said they shot the episodes out of order. Yeah, yeah. Because they had to be in L.A. for two shoots and then Vegas, and they didn't want to travel to Vegas and then travel back to L.A. and then back to Vegas. So he had to pretend like he was surprised that he... Or pretend like he was moving on even though he knew he wasn't moving on because they had already shot the final episode in L.A. Wow. See, I like how it's formatted this year because, like, um, I actually – I don't know. You said you followed me on Twitter, but I tweeted the show the whole – Live tweeting? Yeah. And I wanted Rocky Laborde to win, you know. He didn't win. He came in the top five. Who is it? Rodman? Rodman won? Rodman won, yeah. But – um. You know, but once Rocky, like from the very beginning, I said, oh, top five, it's going to be Rocky, Ida Rodriguez, you know, all these people. And um, I got literally four of the top five. And I was like, oh, I should have put money on this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like. I thought Jimmy Schubert was going to go further. Uh, I thought Ida was going to go further. But no, you know what's weird is like, I, I totally agree. I think it's a little scripted because like Ida's the sweetest person in the world. And then when her and Jimmy had that fight. You know what I mean? There's no way Ida is that mean. You know what I mean? No, so, it's scripted. I, yeah. I, I know a lot of friends who, who are ex last Comic Standing alums. Yeah. So, yeah. And Rocky's like the sweetest guy in the world. You know, he could never say I'm funnier than so-and-so. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's 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 so, reality TV. They want ratings. Yeah, they and want ratings. I, I definitely would do the show again. Just I'm not bad-mouthing them just for the exposure, and it's a good show. Oh, yeah. I'm but, not bad-mouthing them either. I want to be on the show. But huh? it's a rea- reality show. Yeah. So, in in Hollywood, reali- everyone knows reality means fake reality. <laughs> well, see, I didn't know that. Yeah. Come on, Key. No. Are you that naive? Yeah. Well, no, I'm just not that smart. Because <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you a story. I went, before I became a comedian, I wanted to be an actor. But the thing is, is I hated going to auditions because I, I, I don't like people. I'm scared of people. What know? about me? I'm a person. Well, yeah, well, you're different. But like like a whole like that's why i stand up like because like with my asperger's i get like so you know i'm scared of people so i went to audition for tv and i auditioned for the show called next do you know what next was no i don't it was a dating show (laughs) (laughs) okay that's why i don't know it and i didn't even get that like i was like i can't even nail a dating how am i gonna get a sitcom but i remember like the producer was like by the way it's not a real dating experience we're gonna tell her to you know the girl who she could choose and not and i was like oh and then they're like what would you have to offer a woman i was like lots of roses like i'm still trying to fight like i'm still into the game you know <laughs> and they're like no no she's she's not gonna pick you even if you <laughs> i was like lots of roses i got a job you know <laughs> i don't know but yeah all reality shows are fake they're totally fabricated and they have what happened was so you don't know the history with the whole um, the writer strike? Oh yeah, I know that. So the writer strike um, happened right around the time right around the time reality TV started kind of exploding, and the re- so what happened was to be able to work, uh, reality television was invented, or not invented, but it was around for a long time. You know, since the nineties. Yeah, the but fir- it's, it seemed like the first reality TV show was Eliminate. Um, probably you know? people usually say the first reality show is more the Real World. With a, uh, that was going to be my second answer. Yeah. The real world. And so what happened is a lot of writers that I know that couldn't work because they were on strike started to become, quote unquote, p- segment producers for reality TV. Yeah. And basically when you're a segment producer, you do the exact same thing as a writer, but they don't pay, have to pay you writer's guild rates, yeah. which are very, very high for scripted. Wow. So it, it was a way for for Hollywood to still work people around. It's like a workaround. Yeah. So, yeah. But see, Rosie, another thing about you that a lot of people don't know is you have jokes and joke books. I do. Yeah. <laughs> like, that must be cool, right? You get your jokes polished in books. Like, you go to Barnes and & Noble's and you... I know. It's kind of cool. I showed my mom once. She didn't believe me. I think my mom thinks I'm, like, crazy. Yeah. Like, I tell my parents I'm doing comedy and I'm doing stand-up and I'm doing all these things. 
because they've never seen me have a good show key they've only seen me bomb really because there's no comedy club in new orleans so every time they see me in new orleans it's like a bar show yeah and the bar scene in new orleans can be a little bit rough yeah because they're throwing beads and stuff <laughs> right <laughs> no that's not why oh but right. um so my parents have never seen me do well they've never seen me ha- be in front of a real crowd or a good crowd and um i think they think i'm like delusional or crazy and oh. they also my parents don't have much access to the internet because they're older and they don't really they're not that internet savvy yeah so i really think that my parents think i'm like crazy oh uh, <laughs> well rosie trans parents rosie is one of the funniest people in the world <laughs> but i've, I've she's shown, in joke books I, I i showed them one of the jokes books was in barnes and noble and so i drove them to barnes and noble and showed them yeah and then my mom was like oh okay but i really think that Did they, they think, say rosie trans a popular name <laughs> No, they were just, <laughs> that's funny. Um, no, but they were just kind of like, like they don't seem to take it that serious. Though, yeah. I think. So I, I would love for them to come out here and see me perform at a show at Brea or a big crowd or something like that, but they've never have. I, uh, I, uh, once told a girl my jokes were in a joke book <laughs> and, uh, like I, you know, we're at Barnes and Nobles and, uh, I was like, oh yeah, my jokes are in that book. And she acted like she believed me. She's like, really? I was like, yeah. So we I flipped to a page and I just put like a yellow post-it with my joke on it. <laughs> I'm trying to get callers. Wait, you're trying to get callers? We don't need callers. Okay. Um unless you don't want to talk to me. I do want to talk to you, but you're not asking callers. me any questions. What do you want me to ask you? I don't know, it's your show. I, I want I was going to ask you questions. I was going to ask you about movies. Do you ever do any movies? Um You did Driving Bill Wait, was it? That lady was crazy. She didn't know what she was talking about. No, no, you did. Uh, you did a movie with Bill Word, where you played a massage therapist. Didn't I you? didn't play a massage therapist. I played a stripper. A stripper. You played <laughs> stripper. Um, <laughs> yes, I was in a movie with Bill Word. What were you doing? Were you in the contest? How did you meet me from Bill Word? Uh, I was. I think I was in the contest. Bill Word used to do a contest, and I failed at that. I ne- <laughs> I've never won a contest um i i was in a movie playing a stripper i did not strip i just wore a bikini top and a mini skirt and i would miguel fierro was in it he's a comic i don't know if you know him he's still doing stand-up miguel yeah yeah he runs the hostel in hollywood does he really yeah sundays and wednesday nights every week i'm gonna have to give him a call yeah um he was in the movie um dave farrell was in the film all these are comedians i don't know if you guys follow the comedy world in la at all if not you're like who the heck is that um and i've been in a couple movies i was in a movie with dennis rodman <laughs> yeah simon says um no it was about midgets oh oh i'm sorry little people excuse hey, me yeah um, the term midget is considered derogatory because brad williams is a huge listener of the show <laughs> no because i don't want to offend any midget um people the people who are offended by the word midget so little people yeah um it was about Dennis Robin coaching a basketball team. Full, I was just a high school midgets. I was yeah. Oh, excellent. I was, I was a high school student in the movie. I've been in a bunch of small movies and short films. Nothing big yet, fingers crossed. Well, you're you're writing a sitcom, aren't you? I thought you were writing a sitcom about us as husband and wife. Oh, uh, I probably just said that. Uh, but um, another question I had for you. Oh, someone's calling. Someone's calling. Thanks to Rosie Trans Twitter. I gotta put the headphones on. Oh, headphones. Headphones. <laughs> Hello. 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 Hi, what's your name? Hi, my name's Andrew. It's my husband! Andrew! Oh, no! <laughs> this is not cool. What's oh, up, buddy? No. What are you doing with my wife? I'm interviewing her. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, how are you, buddy? Good. How are yeah. you? Doing well. For the folks at home who don't know who Andrew is, uh, Andrew's Rosie Trans husband. Husband. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say why. <laughs> Just so you know, we had another caller who um, didn't know who Keith was. <laughs> oh it, no. Yeah, she thought I was like this. She thought you were named someone named Renee. R- R- and she's like, "Isn't this Renee's show?" <laughs> Wait, is that is that what she said? I thought she said Rebecca. <laughs> Maybe Rebecca. <laughs> oh. Do you have a question for me, Are husband? Guys, question. What um, what have you guys been talking about already tonight? We've been talking about comedy and movies. We've and been talking about how Rosie uh, lost to Last Comic Standing <laughs> to that. Oh, no. 
don't bring that up. No, no, no. But um, I asked her before the show. I was like, what do you want me not to ask you? She's like, oh, please don't talk about Last Comic Standing. I was like, excellent. So I asked her. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I asked her about Last Comic Standing. All right. One more question and then off the air. We have other callers, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well... I, my question would be, what's the hardest thing um, in stand-up comedy? Was it for me or Keith or both? Both. Okay, Keith, what I'll is I'll take the... my question off the air. Oh, oh my gosh, what an expert, expert. Wow. That was a... Uh... Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for calling. Bye, Andrew. Yep. <laughs> now you have eight Bye. listeners, Keith. I have eight listeners. <laughs> I didn't tell you to tell Andrew to call. <laughs> Uh, but no, Andrew. The hardest thing about stand-up comedy is a uh, is um getting work. I think. I I would agree uh, with you. I think the hardest thing about stand-up comedy is getting work and the perpetual um BS networking that you have to do with other people. I see. So the thing is, like, I don't I don't suck up to people. You know what I mean? I don't suck up to people either. But I notice that a lot of people that get a lot of work are really good at sucking up to other people. Oh. Uh, yeah. I had a question for you, but then Andrew called and ruined the question. Keith. <laughs> no, so the joke books. You got your jokes in books. They paid you, obviously, for that. Nope. They what? don't pay you, and they don't give you royalties. Are you serious? Unless it's your book. But it wasn't a book. my book. It was a submission book. Oh, my God. That yes. sucks. Cause I- Bill Cosby isn't the only one raving people around here. Oh. <laughs> Oh, what is it with you and Bill Cosby? You guys have history or something? I just want everyone to know Bill Cosby raped my cat. Oh, come on. You don't want to go there. That's out of the box. Uh, that's the name of my podcast. I know. <laughs> that's, uh, that's stuff for the out of the box. Um, That's so strange because I remember I was at Barnes and & Noble's and I saw your joke on it. I was like, oh, this is cool. What joke book? I've been in like seven. Yeah, you've been on like seven like joke, joke books. books. It's called a Rosie Tran's Jokes <laughs> by Rosie Tran. If it said that, I would get paid for it. Yeah, and I, yeah. I bought it, and they had your picture on it. And my picture in it? Yeah, yeah. Had your picture. Did you just superimpose my picture on a joke book, Keith, and then put your post-it note inside of it? Oh, no. no. <laughs> that was a different joke book. Call back. Call back. Um, okay, so you've been doing comedy for at least 10 years, right? At the least. At least. <laughs> now, because... Um, okay, so uh, let me go back to Andrew's question. The hardest part of comedy is watching half of my friends that I started with quit and the other half surpass me. <laughs> oh, I, I, I don't think that's the hardest part because, like, you got to be happy for guys like that. But see, when guys that I started with quit that are so funny, like, I mean... That uh, hurts. That, that hurts. hurts. It, okay, let me rephrase that. The hardest part about watching comedy, I mean, the hardest part about being a comedian is having half of the people I started with quit and the other half succeed and half of the half that succeeded were people that I didn't like. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that, that? Make, that makes it better. <laughs> but no, like, you remember Tom Brab? Don't tell me Tom quit. First yeah. of all, don't say, do you remember Tom Brab? We're related by marriage. Are you really? Yes. Oh, we should get Tom Vrab to call. Tom Vrab. I loved Tom Vrab. His uncle, Eddie Vrab, was married to my cousin, Kimmy Vrab, who divorced him and now is named Kimmy Ta. So you guys aren't related anymore. But we were related for like a really long time. Oh. And he, I was like, when I met Tom, I said, Tom Vrab. I said, are you related to Eddie Vrab in Orange County? Because he said he was from Orange County. And he said, yeah. yeah, that's my uncle. I said, you know, we're related by marriage, right? And he said wait a minute and he said he goes is your cousin i said my cousin's married to him and she's like is, he's like is your cousin named kim i said yeah and we realized that we were related wow by marriage wow <laughs> i must have ruined the physical attraction <laughs> from that right did tom quit comedy yeah he hasn't done comedy in like three years i see him on like vine and other things so i just thought he did funny video comedy stuff more tom Brad was my favorite stand-up man and like i try and write him on the facebook but he never reads the message. why did he quit uh, I just think it's something because he lost his father to this thing called death. I don't know if you know what death is. I do know what death is, but yeah. that's not a reason to quit stand up. Yeah, but that I mean, it, that's why ever since his dad died, he hasn't done stand up comedy. 
So you put the two and two together. Like I'm a But cons- yeah, but you're making stuff up. He may have been frustrated with the business before that and that was like the straw that broke the camel's back or something. Maybe. Or, you know, you could do conspiracy theory with me. <laughs> <laughs> you're like literally making it up. Like you don't know that's the reason. No, no, that's definitely the reason. Because I write I wrote him I said, Hey, sorry because I lost uh, I lost my grandfather to death around the same time and I thought about quitting, but I didn't. You know, so I wrote But why would losing your grandfather make you want to quit stand up? Because it's like why in the world it's not funny anymore. You know what I mean? Like jokes aren't funny anymore. You I, don't understand, I don't, obviously. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about yeah. because when I'm depressed or have negative things happen in my life, stand up pulls me out of it. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, that's so what I'm trying to say. So why would death or something miserable but, make you want to quit something that's But see, like, my, my pop went to all my shows. So when he died, I wanted to, like, quit because it's like, what's the point when he won't be laughing? Well, he's laughing in heaven. Well, yeah, then I started reading the Bible and I figured out he's laughing in heaven. Aww, yeah. That's so sweet. Yeah. But no, so Tom Vrab was the funniest. And then, um, but see, it seems like with you, like, you know, like, you were way out there, you know, now you're just slow, you know, you're just doing work every now and then, you know what I mean? Like, you I was, I got burnt out. I was doing, there was a time, it was a, you were like the number one requested comic. There was a time when I really, really was doing well with stand up and I just got burnt by so many people, including club owners and comedy clubs. You know, I did a club, I'm not going to say which club because I don't want to badmouth them. I did a club. I was promised a certain amount of money. The show was basically sold out. I had 70 pre-sale tickets just because I was on the, na- the the bill and I was pretty popular at the time. And, you know, they tried to short me. I ended up getting paid only $300 when I should have gotten over $1,000 yeah. for the show. That, you know, a couple other things happened. I had a falling out with, with some really bad people in the industry that I'm glad I'm not friends with anymore. And I just kind of got burnt out. So I'm just doing shows here and there. But I love stand-up. But it seems like the shows you're doing now are like with Dave Artell or something. You know, you do a lot of shows with Dave. Um, I haven't done that many shows with Dave lately. But um, I, I'm here I'm here, here and there. Yeah. And then you opened up for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you, Keith. Then you saw my lollipop. <laughs> <laughs> What's your... What's your favorite stand-up comedy road experience? I don't have a favorite co- road experience, but I have a favorite show. Okay, favorite show. My favorite, one of my favorite Before shows. Before you answer, it can't be the one that you opened up for me. It wasn't. Okay, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite shows of all time was actually a dive bar out in Montebello. And it was a biker bar, and there was a lot of gang members there. And it was a really tough room. It was a really tough room, and it, it went on for a long time. Willie Barcena ran it, and then he stopped running it, and Felipe Esparza ran it for a while. And then he it, won last comic standing. And then I think he gave it up to someone else. I don't know if it's still running, but it was you know running f- for over 10-plus years. And, um, uh, you know, one night, it was a really rough night, and, and not no one was really having a good set, and the crowd really was rough. You know, I think they may have closed down comedy because someone got stabbed there. I mean, it was a rough bar. Really? And um, I almost got stabbed at the boiler room a few weeks ago. I almost got attacked recently as well. So I don't know what's up with audiences. Yeah, it seems <laughs> it seems like everyone's like wanting to stab comedians. <laughs> I almost got attacked recently at a show. I can't remember what show it was, but it was like within the past few weeks. So I haven't done that many shows. So I can probably look at my calendar and figure it out. But um, it wasn't at the improv. It wasn't at the improv. Yeah, even though the even though there was, was a bar a fight. fight, there was two bar fights <laughs> while you were performing on stage, and you that thought you were being weird. handled. I think I handled that well, though. You did. You I you mean, handled it really well, Big, and you didn't know what was going on because it was way in the back anyway. I wouldn't have known what's going on anyway. Yeah. Because. But yeah, that was one of my favorite shows, and everyone was having a bad set, and I and went up there you and you killed I, it. You saved the show. I I you know I don't regularly say oh i killed it i was awesome i was amazing but i really turned the show around and and you saved the show i didn't save the show because actually no one could follow me and and nobody did well after me yeah <laughs> but i just remember do you know mike moratori yeah yeah I know mike, mike moratori was at that show and i remember him just saying that he had a lot of respect for me and he couldn't believe that i 
like nobody could believe there was a lot of you know pretty big comedians there but it was just such a rough night for some reason and i don't know what i did but i was just you know when you just have a really good set and you just like yeah. just everything clicks that's okay. what happened i just had a really good set everything clicked they just really liked me and i just got them on my side for that 10 or 15 minutes i was up there yeah and like nobody was doing well before me and no one could follow me it's awesome yeah so that was the best show i've ever had see that <laughs> see that's the thing like i've always wanted to like experience like because like i'm not the thing is like i don't i don't hear laughter so like i never when i do stand up i never know if i'm doing good or doing because you bad. space out or something no just with like my aspergers and stuff i don't like when i talk to people it's like i don't i don't see expressions i just see question marks when i talk to people and it's very like frustrating because like when i do stand up I'm doing stand for, stand up in front of a room with question marks. What does that mean? Question marks? Like it looks like there's a big question mark on my face, or I don't yeah, understand. Yeah, exactly. There's like, a big or you can't read, like a physical question mark. Yeah, there's like a yeah, like your face is blurry. I mean, yeah. So it's like when I do stand up, it's kind of hard because like when people laugh and stuff, I don't know if they're laughing. Like it takes a minute, you know what I mean? Like that's why I could never tell there was a fight at the show. <laughs> <laughs> there's no way you could tell it was really dark i was too. like you were, there's spotlights on you they were way in the back yeah but the cops came it was crazy yeah. <laughs> the cops came the guy got arrested it was like and see the see the thing is like um that that's the hardest part for me about comedy because like it's getting work because to get more work you have to be funny like that's the number one goal you know then you have to like you know <laughs> 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 excuse okay. me i got a got a cough drop in my uh in my throat (laughs) but the number two thing is you have to do a lot of uh sucking up to people you know and see the thing is i don't suck up i have to rely on funny so like when i'm not funny i think it burns my bridges with everybody you know what i mean i don't think it does i i think i think that networking is more important than being funny unfortunately okay i'll give you i think and i think not being funny you're funny keith but not being funny can help you and this is how Okay, Do you, you, know you how tell me else? how and then I'll I'll prove you wrong. Go. Okay. Well, a lot of I'm not going to name names on the air, but no, I'll tell no, you off no, here. No names. A no. lot of big headliners do not want their openers to be funnier than them. Oh, yeah. I know that. So, how are you proving me wrong? So, okay. not being funny helps you get more work sometimes. Sometimes that's true. No, but not sometimes, a lot of times. Okay. 5% of the time that's true. Uh, I can pull out the improv lineup and go through who opens for who. Okay, we could do that after <laughs> the show. But no, I'll, I, I'm going to give you an example, and this is when I, I'm not going to say the venue. You just, want, you just want to prove your point. No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to say the name of the venue or the booker or whatever, you know, because you know we got to help protect the, you know. But we actually had to talk about this a couple of days ago. I opened up for I opened up for you on the road. We did four shows. You did. You killed on three of them. One show you did not do that well. One show I bombed horribly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the thing is, I think that was the sold out show. <laughs> so, so I did bad, but I I do remember the other shows I did good, you know, because everyone was like, oh, pictures, all that stuff. Uh, for you know that show, I didn't do bad. I did really bad. That venue hasn't contacted me ever So since. you're proving my point that being funny does not matter. No, what I'm saying is like being not funny because I was, a lot, I was not funny on w- that one show. So it won't give me But that's not work. the reason that you're not getting booked. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> Must be my Bill Cosby story. Yeah. <laughs> but no, see, I run... I run a lot of shows because I got to the point where, like, when I started, you know, besides you, you know, you would put me up for five minutes and stuff. But, you know, the thing is, like, I started running shows because no one else would. So I had to put myself up. You know what I mean? So that's why I did it. So who else do you know that's quit comedy that you're sad about? Or just Tom? Tom's probably the most heartbreaking one. There's a lot of them. Uh, Do you remember the Drinking Buddies guys? Chris Adams and Jerry Brandt. Yeah, I do. Jerry yeah. Brandt. Brandt, whatever. <laughs> He's a nice guy. Did they quit stand up? I know Chris Adams did. Why? I don't know. Got drunk, I guess. 
drinking buddies. <laughs> Do you know how Chris Adams started stand up? Uh, I don't. Drinking? No, he was following me around doing a documentary about me. Oh, <laughs> was he really? He was. See, for, he was at he was at UC Long Beach. I mean, Cal State Long Beach. And he was doing a documentary for his film class. <laughs> I, I did his radio show, and that was the last time I saw him. So he was following me around doing a documentary about stand-up, and then he started doing stand-up. All right. Another question for Rosie Tran, since obviously she just wants questions. <laughs> I've had a lot of bad... I'm not saying Chris's documentary is bad. I don't think Chris's documentary ever got finished, but I've been in a lot of stand-up documentaries <laughs> about yeah. people that are trying to make it in stand-up. Those are the worst. I know! <laughs> like, there's one in Orange County mm-hmm. called Orange County Comedy. And uh, the thing is, like, I don't like doing comedy in Orange County because I think all the comics out there are kind of, you know, they don't know what comedy is. You know what I mean? Why do you say that? Like, it's more of like a socializing thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's not because, like, when you go to the open mics there, they're not that good. They do the, you know, they don't stick to the art of making people laugh. Why don't you come and move up here? I can't afford it. You know, that's a. What about what about getting a job up here? Yeah, well, I know you find me that attractive, but uh, (laughs) I don't know how many other ladies will find me, you know, because let's face it, I'm kind of big and, uh, you know, I'm not packing much, you know, literal I'm not asking you to be a model. What do you think I'm asking you to do? Like, get a job up here. Like, don't you think you can do what you do in Orange County up here? No. Because, see, in Orange County, uh, people were desperate for attention. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, but no so there's this orange county documentary and i watched it because i went to the premiere it was the worst thing i was like oh my god it's like they should have just ask me to do it you know <laughs> but they don't and i think i think they stay away from me which i'm kind of glad but then i'm kind of not because it's like you know like i think i'm even though i'm orange county i think i'm more la like i do more shows in la and riverside and road and stuff i don't mm-hmm. really do like the only thing I'll do in Orange County in Orange County is like the improvs and stuff, but other than that, so that's why I started you know doing shows. Now another question: How much material do you actually have? Current material, just thirty to forty-five minutes. Material, material, probably two or three hours. So you could do stand-up for two or three hours. If I don't think I could do stand-up for two or three hours. You don't think so? I would get, I get tired. Uh, first of all, I'm hypoglycemic, which is why I had to stop and get food. And I have to eat every two hours. Two, I have to eat every two hours. Otherwise, I, my blood sugar crashes when I'm resting, when yeah. I'm doing something leisurely. When I do stand up, at about the 15 to 20 minute mark, I start getting physically exhausted. Really? I actually did a show up in Palmdale for Stacy Hall, who no longer runs the show, at this, um, at this nightclub that he was trying to start a comedy club up there and about 15 minutes and i actually started having a dizzy spell and i had to sit on the stool and finish my set sitting on the stool ouch yeah so i do not think i could do stand up for two or three hours i maybe i could sit like bill cosby sits yeah <laughs> bill cosby. and um and and do material but i don't know how funny it would be because i like moving around and being animated but for me i use so much energy when i'm on stage it's like channeled energy because I like to do some crowd work and I also like to talk to the audience sometimes. And I also like to make jokes up and improv, um, true improv. Some comedians pretend like the improv, but they have pre-prepared answers. Yeah. Um, a lot of comics have that. A lot of comics do that. Cause like the reason why I asked that question is cause like it drives me nuts when you ask how much time can you do and they'll tell you more time just to impress you. No, I can do 30 to 45 minutes. Really, really good, solid material. You've seen me Yeah. when I headline. Um, I cannot do an hour. I cannot do a current hour. I, I can't. Yeah. You I can't? have two, I think or, you I have two hour. or three hours of material. I think you could definitely do an hour. I don't I th- think I could do an hour. Yeah. I, I've never done an hour. The most I've ever done is 45, 50 minutes max. I think I did 50 minutes. I Actually, I did. I did 50 minutes on Bob Perkel's show at the Beachcomber because the headliner did not show up and I was featuring. So at 30, he gave me the, the light. And Bob Perkel did shows at the Beachcomber? Yeah. Bob Perkel, he gave me the light at 30 and then the headliner never showed up. So he did a thing with his hand to keep going because the headliner was stuck in traffic or something. I don't know what happened. Anyway, the headliner never showed up. So I ended up doing 50 minutes. Wow. That's interesting. The beach car. Well, I could do, I could do a strong 30, but I'm pushing to 45. Like I did an hour and 10 minutes in San Diego. 
I don't like doing but, longer sets because I'm the type of comedian I'm not comfortable 100% with myself. A lot of comedians are very comfortable if they're just talking. I am doing not whatever. comfortable at all. I'm not comfortable with myself. I don't like silence. I like laughter. Yeah. I'm a crowd pleaser audience. I don't like people who go up there and they're bombing and they're still up there. Like when I surf bombing, I want to get out of there quick. Yeah. yeah. Like I want to do well. I want people. And then laughing. when you're headlining, you have to do a certain amount that you said you'll do or you won't get paid. Or you can give it to Rosie Tran if she's in the yeah. audience. Yeah. <laughs> but, but no, so like I've been doing stand up for 11 years. I've only done an hour set twice, both this year. But it's not like where I'm comfortable saying I have an hour. You know what I mean? I don't like when comics do that. And I don't like when comics say they have a solid 30 and then they only have a solid 10. That's what I'm saying. It's like, it's look, like, I want just people be honest. laughing. Yeah. I want people laughing at me. I don't want to be up there. To- just because you're standing on a stage talking for does half not an mean hour you does have not any- mean you're doing a half an hour of stand-up. That's what I was trying to say. No, like, it's awful. It's like, absolutely awful and comedians should not do it. Do I, not do it, comics. It makes you look bad. Because I remember... You asked me before you took me on the road. You're like, how much time do you have? I was like, three. And you're like, 30 minutes? Excellent. I was like, no, three minutes. <laughs> and, I mean, <laughs> it's, it hurts when you're up there and, and people aren't laughing. It oh, yeah. hurts. And then also when comics, you know, they they just say that they have certain whatever under their belt and they don't. It's like you can't. It's not good uh, to be just, up there talking we, and not no one's laughing. We just got the light. So, uh we got to go. That was a fast hour, man. But um Rosie Tran, uh, we should follow you on the Funny Rosie, right? On yeah, the I'm Twitter. Yeah, on Twitter at Funny Rosie. If you guys really 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 want to support me more than anything, then go to out of the box podcast.com um and get some knowledge on. I interview some pretty interesting and amazing people from all walks of life. Um also, I have one religious episode. I'm not a religious nut at all, but I've gotten some comments about that. People, open your minds. I'm just interviewing this guy about religion. I'm not saying my personal religious views, so that kind of bugged me. I have to get it up, get it out there. <laughs> ah. Well, follow Rosie. I love Rosie, and I think America loves Rosie, too. And, uh, yeah, it's cool that you were on the get at the show. I appreciate that so much. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, uh, follow Funny Rosie on Twitter, and uh, me, follow Keith Reza. Uh, if you want to hear Bill Cosby's stories. <laughs> All right. Uh, stay tuned for next week uh, as the final episode of season one. Uh, thanks, guys. Have a good night. You're listening to Razor Riffs with Keith Razor and Alan Lee right here on LA Talk Radio.